Thanks. So, as, as, as you heard, I'm a chemist, and so you, you could also call, also call this a chemical approach to microbes and disease. But let me start what I'm going to tell you by trying to put things, uh, what we're trying to do, uh, in a much bigger uh, context. And, and, and I can show roughly what we're trying to do here. And we're trying to, to break the tyranny right, of this view of the world, right? so that when you ask students, how does information get transferred in biology? They'll say, well, you know, it's DNA to RNA to proteins. And you say, is that all? Oh, no, no. There, there are retroviruses. So sometimes it's RNA to DNA to RNA to protein. And uh, in fact, actually, most of the information transfer <laughs> is really done with, uh, with small molecules, certainly all the conditional transfer of information. And so I just put a few, uh, a few up there, and let me, uh, let me pick two, um, testosterone and estradiol, probably responsible <laughs> for many of your teaching problems. But, <laughs> but they are, you know, if you, if you look at them, they look remarkably similar, right? I mean, it's, it's hard to tell the difference between them. Yet, the difference is really profound. Uh, what they do is they bind to a protein, and then they regulate uh, DNA. And because they have slightly different shapes, they bind to slightly different proteins, and they regulate completely different DNAs. So they take two completely different developmental pathways, right? um, and it's all governed, right? That is, the, the, the development of the, uh, what are usually called the indifferent uh, sex organs that we're born with, is all governed by those two molecules. And, uh, uh, and they're small molecules. They're, for example, the sort of molecules that organic chemists, such as myself, would study. And so a lot of our DNA goes into coding uh, for small molecules. A lot of the proteins that are made go into the biosynthesis of small molecules. And so, uh, one of the things that we're always trying to do in the lab is show the role of small molecules in, uh, in biology. So this is the, the story. So I want to tell you one story and then some ramifications of that story. And, and the story is, uh, is a little complicated, but, um, but, it, but in many ways it's also reasonably straightforward. So the story actually starts here. And what you can see are two dead pine trees, two dead loblolly pines, an increasingly familiar, familiar sight. And the reason, uh, uh, the reason they're dying is about eight weeks earlier, uh, a southern pine beetle, female southern pine beetle, was flying and spotted somehow those trees, one of those trees, as being a little weakened for maybe because of environmental stress, maybe because of some other reason. And so she, uh, she attacked the tree. And, and uh, this is not quite microbial yet, but the, but the beetles are very small. So you can see, this is the palm of someone's hand. There's a grain of rice. These are the beetles we're talking about. So a, a, a beetle that small is actually really what, what, brought down, what brought down the pine tree. What she did uh, was try to uh, bore a hole through the bark into the pine tree. And, and as you know, uh, pine tree bark is relatively thin. And then underneath the bark of any tree is, is essentially everything that matters. That's where all the nutrients and, and fluids are flowing up and down. And so trees try to defend things from getting, getting in through their bark. Sometimes it's mechanical with very thick bark. And sometimes it's chemical. And so in the case of, of pines, what they typically do is pour out this pitch that you're probably familiar with. And that's supposed to discourage the female beetle. Um, but if, uh, but if she keeps going and thinks she's getting somewhere, what she does is she sends out a signal. It actually is a, is a little molecule called frontalin, uh, which, which comes from the species of the beetle. But it's called an aggregation pheromone. And so all the other female beetles that are flying around, they, they get a whiff of this. They say someone's got one. And they all uh, start converging on this tree. And, and the tree undergoes um, sort of a a scary term. It undergoes a mass attack of females. And so, and so this shows a tree that's undergone a mass attack of females. And each of those little white spots that you can see is the dried resin. 
and then that dry, and that will that will fall off, and it, it litters around, uh, makes a little pile around the base of the tree, and the rangers call it popcorn because that's what it looks like. Okay, and then uh, the females get uh, into the tree. Oh, but before the females get into the tree, they call the males. That's another pheromone, and the males come. They uh, they mate inside the tree. The females lay eggs. Uh, the eggs uh, develop into larvae. The larvae go through four larval stages, and then all the larvae exit. And then it looks like someone has just just taken uh, a drill to the tree, and and you can go from a few beetles to a few million beetles uh, literally over the course of uh, uh, of a couple of weeks. And then I don't know I, that one doesn't show very well, but then it spreads throughout an area because then you have large numbers of beetles. They start attacking the trees next to it. And then you have these huge uh, swaths of, uh, of, dead, uh, of dead trees. And, um, and, and I knew that, actually. And I had, I had actually worked on, on, on this problem and many years ago. And if you'd asked me, uh, is that it? I would have said, yeah, that's pretty much it. And if you'd said, how does the tree die? I'd say, well, you know, the larvae are eating the tree. And, and you know, it's a mess. At the end. Now, then all of that turns out to be uh, wrong. <laughs> so what really happens is, is the following. Uh, this is now what you, what you would see if you peeled the bark off the tree. And you can see uh, what, what's called a, a, a gallery. Um, but it's, it's basically these, these tracks that are made by the, the female excavating uh, underneath the bark. And she lays eggs. And these eggs uh, develop uh, into larvae, as I told you. And then the, the larvae. Uh, go through their developmental stages and then and then they leave. So that part is true. What 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 isn't so uh, so obvious maybe from this picture is that actually uh, the larvae don't eat the tree. Um, what the larvae eat is a fungus that happens to be there. Okay, this white stuff that you can see is uh, is a fungus, and it has. Uh, it has sort of a weird name, so we'll just call it the food fungus or, or ES. But what the larvae does uh, is actually eats the fungus. And, um, and, and when, when you learn that, you, you say, well, actually, that makes a lot of, um, a lot of sense um, uh, that, that, that a larvae, uh, that, 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 they would eat, uh, that, that they would eat the fungus. And they get all of their nutrition, in fact, from the fungus. So they're, they're not eating the tree. They're letting the fungus dissolve the tree, and then they eat the fungus. And then you would say, you know, it's pretty handy that that fungus is growing there just when the larvae need them. And of course, it's not just handy. The, the fungus was brought in, in fact, by the female beetle. So the female beetle has a little compartment there, and what would be the neck of beetle's head next, um, <laughs> called the mycangium. Um, and it's a, it's, a, and it's a compartment then to, to store fungi, and, and this, this shows sort of fungal hyphae uh, in, uh, uh, actually in the tree. And so as, as the female beetle goes around in the tree, she seeds it with this, uh, with this fungus. And so when her larvae hatch, they're ready there to eat, um, to eat the fungus. So that, uh, that's interesting. And then it, it turns out that, uh, just to say a little about fungi, because they're almost always ignored. I mean, everyone talks about bacteria and viruses and everything else. But fungi are really quite interesting. And I mean, much more like us than they are like, like the other microbes. And uh, so, so mostly, they don't look like mushrooms. They mostly look like sort of the black stuff growing on your shower. And, uh, and, and, the, and, and it's the mass of these thread-like things called hyphae. And the lifestyle of a fungus, so I just wanted to make that point, is that they, they excrete enzymes that, that you know, can dissolve cellulose, can dissolve lignans. And so they take the solid substance of a tree, make it into soluble small molecules, which they then absorb, and then, uh, and, and then uh, the, the insects uh, eat them. So that's the, sort of the fungal uh, lifestyle. Now, there's actually, if you go back to this picture, color isn't very good, but there's also a blue fungus there. Okay. which is, uh, has, a, has a, uh, a real name, and, but is usually just referred to as the blue stain fungus. And the blue stain fungus always comes with the, uh, with the pine beetle. 
And it's, a, it's problematic for the pine beetle because the blue stain fungus will overgrow the food fungus. Okay. And so therefore, it's antagonistic to the, to the beetle. And you might then wonder, how does the blue fungus get in there? Um, and the blue fungus, well, let me actually say, the blue fungus historically was considered to ruin the, uh, ruin the wood, make it uh, unsaleable. And so they, uh, so it's typically burned right on the spot. And, uh, uh, and, and they treated outbreaks of, of bark beetles or pine beetles uh, essentially the way you would treat cancer. They would cut all those trees down, all the trees around it down, and burn them. And that was, that was how it was handled. Recently, um, uh, some entrepreneurs have started selling it as, uh, as blue wood. Nature's, wood dyed blue by nature. That's what it's called. Right? <laughs> and, um, and it's very popular in Japan. But this is, uh, this is uh, from a Canadian company. Um, all right, that's an aside that has nothing to do with what I was talking about. <laughs> and so, then, so the question then is, is where, where does the, where does the uh, blue fungus come from, the blue stain fungus comes from? The answer is there. You've probably mostly spotted it by now. Um, and so if you look at that little thing, um, that's a mite, right, that lives on the fungus. Okay. I mean, sorry, that lives on the beetle. So it, it hitchhikes a ride on the beetle. So that's what phoretic means, hitchhiker. And, uh, and so there are these phoretic mites, tarsinomid mites, uh, that have the blue stain fungus all over them. And they actually seed the tree with the blue fungus so the eggs and larvae that they lay can, can, eat, can eat that. But that's not part of this story, right? So, so that's where the, uh, where the, blue, uh, the blue fungus uh, comes from. Now, uh, so, so, so the story was, was complicated enough. And, and that, I would say, was, was really then completely the story up until about a year and a half ago. So there was, uh, there was a tree, there was a beetle, there was a mite, and there were two fungi um, that, in terms of the, of the beetle, uh, one was uh, a mutualist because it was the food fungus. One was an antagonist because it uh, killed that. And then a friend of mine was, was actually looking uh, carefully at the, uh, at the mycangium. And he looked at the mycangium uh, carefully and, and really with a fresh set of eyes. People had been looking at the mycangium for, for many decades. And what he realized was that these things, these, these things, those are fungal hyphae. That's what a fungal hyphae looks like. But these things that look like sort of you know, ball bearings in a, in, you know, in a tube or something like that actually are not a fungus. That's a bacteria. That, that, that's very characteristic of strep. Okay? So strep make these, um, uh, these cells that connect one to another. Then they sporulate, right? And times get tough. And then you see these spores connected to each other. And so, in fact, the mycangium was completely misnamed. I mean, it was named after Mick, uh, my, like mycology, the study of, of fungi, but it really is a container for bacteria. I mean, there, there happen to be some fungi there, but it's really been, but it really is mostly a bacterial carrier. And so they did what, what anyone would do, or at least any ecologist would do. They went out and they captured about a thousand female beetles. They plated out uh, the, the bacteria from each, each of those, and in all of them, they found the same, the same bacteria. They found occasionally they would find other bacteria, but the fact that you find the same one in this compartment right, means that it must have some role, right? that there's a specialized compartment for it, and it's, always, uh, and it's always there. And the role turns out to be that that bacteria makes an antifungal agent. <laughs> and the antifungal agent kills the blue fungus much better than it kills the food fungus. So it carries a bacteria, right, that, that will make an antibiotic that will protect its food fungus um, in, in, the, in the face of the threat from this antagonistic fungus. Okay. That's, that's the new story. And, uh, and, and then as a chemist, that's the really interesting story. Because when you see something like this, what it means is you have a bacteria growing there, a fungus there, but it won't grow up. You can see where it started. And, and what it means is that there's some small molecule being made that's diffusing through there. And that small molecule is suppressing the growth of, uh, of the other fungus. 
of, of this fungus. Whereas here, it, it can you know, literally get surrounded by that, so it's not nearly as toxic to this, the food fungus, as it is to that. And uh, so it's a complicated story. So let me just go over it quickly. So we've gone over all the pieces. So we have a beetle, and the beetle carries in its food fungus. So it carries it in, so it vectors it from tree to tree, so it confers a benefit on that. This feeds the, the beetle's larvae, so that's a classic mutualist uh, relationship. There's this fungus, which is largely antagonistic because it, it, it can overwhelm the food fungus. It gets in on the, on the beetle, right? So the beetle confers a benefit on, on it, but because of that, it does not confer, it, 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 it's antagonistic, so that's an antagonistic relationship. The bacteria that I was telling you about is uh, carried in by the beetle. It kills this, <laughs> so therefore, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. It's, it, it's, that's, that's a mutualistic relationship. And so, uh, and so forgetting now about the tree, um, poor tree, it, it, it's now a, a system with, with uh, two fungi, uh, an insect, and a bacteria. And the, in, the first problem we wanted to work on, there's chemistry obviously all over here, is what's the molecule, and for reasons that I'll, I'll try to explain why that's interesting, what's the molecule that the bacteria makes to kill that? And uh, that just shows uh, what, the, uh, what the experiment uh, was. And this summarizes about nine months of hard work uh, by a very talented uh, postdoc, uh, actually a graduate student and a postdoc. And uh, this will probably come out in science in about uh, another six weeks or so. And so the, it, was, it was this molecule which we called mycangiomycin. And mycangium af after where uh, the, the bacteria grew. And it's a, it's a funny looking molecule. Uh, I think you're all biology teachers, and so I won't tell you what a fabulous, uh, what, what's, but there are many things that are interesting uh, about, uh, about, this, uh, about this molecule. One of them is that it has a peroxide. And peroxides are relatively rare in, uh, in organic molecules. And they are, uh, as, as you probably know, they're rather unstable. Okay. It also has uh, all of these double bonds um, and those are also relatively unstable. So this whole molecule is, is quite unstable, and there are really, uh, to, to, I mean, to a chemist looking at this, there actually are two, two mysteries. And the first is, how could a bacteria figure out how to make that? That actually is not easy to make in the lab. Okay? So, so, so that's an interesting question. And the other question is, how did it make all of those because there's a standard way to make those, but if you did it the standard way, you wouldn't get this, right? So every one of those is in the wrong position. If, I mean, that's essentially the problem. So something, something happened to, to, to move them all. And so it was an interesting question then in how, how the bacteria made this. And, uh, and, and, and so that was then one of the, one of the next things that we wanted, wanted to work on. So we now figured out what the small molecule was and we wanted to know how it, how it was made. And I, I just put this in because this has changed completely uh, in just the last few years. Historically, you would have then tried to find the proteins that were making this and, and you know, grinding things up and doing that. But now, uh, actually what you do is we just sequence the entire genome of the, of the bacteria. Uh, we did it at the Broad uh, Institute, which is just, just down the road. And to, to literally to sequence uh, the uh, about five and a half megabases of, uh, of DNA in, in this bacterial genome took an afternoon. So, um, so we could find, uh, find the, all of the genes, and then we just sort of went through the genes and, and, and until we finally found what we were looking for. And, uh, and, and what we were looking for looked something like this. The, the only point I want to make, and, and it, it's, it's a point that will become important later on, is why we were able to find them, is when bacteria make small molecules. They make them, obviously, with proteins that are encoded in these genes, but the genes are all together, right? They're all clustered. 
When we make something like testosterone or estradiol, you know, obviously we do it with proteins that are encoded in our genes, but they're spread all over the chromosome. Right? They're not clustered the way things are in a bacteria. And that actually tells you something about how bacteria live uh, and why it's completely different, or how bacteria evolved and why it's completely different from the way uh, we evolved. But let me, let me just say that, that we found one big gene that probably puts, puts the 20 uh, carbons together. We found these genes in blue that we think are doing all of this. And then the sort of my favorite, we found the gene uh, that's marked in red that we think puts in this peroxide. Okay. Um, then, all right, so now we knew what the molecule was. We knew, um, uh, we knew, um, we, we know how it's made, at least how it's made by the bacteria. Then what, what this shows is, is what this shows, except it's tough to publish things like that. You have to publish things like this. So <laughs> this means alive. This means dead, right, along this axis. So this is live, dead. And this is dose on, in a log scale. And so they're, they're standard kill curves. And so uh, you take a fungus, and you keep giving it more and more mycangiomycin, and then you measure uh, where it dies, and you do it with another fungus, and you measure where it dies. And you can see that the difference between these two is a difference of about a factor of 15. That is, the, 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 the antagonistic fungus is 15 times more sensitive uh, than the food fungus. And, and factor 15 might not seem like that much to you, but for example, in bacteria, when we say that bacteria have become resistant to an antibiotic, that's typically about a factor of 10. Okay? These are not, you know, factors of a thousand. These are, these are relatively small, small factors. Okay, so here's a question. It had to be that way for the two fungi. That's what I've told you. Okay. What if you do it for a third fungus? Okay. And, and what the, what's behind the question is the following. How did this system evolve? Did it evolve so that the bacteria learned to make something that was especially deadly to this? Right. Or did this learn not to get killed by whatever this was making? Okay. And it, be happy to know that all of the smart money uh, was here. That is, that the, um, the, 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 the fungus, so that the bacteria had learned to specialize in killing this. And so if you did a third one and a fourth one and a fifth one, they would all fall along that line. It turns out, of course, that it's this that's especially resistant. Everything else you try is along this, this line or, or, or worse. Um, so that actually has two pieces of good news. One, all the experts were wrong. That's always good. And the second is uh, that all the pathogenic fungi that, that you, know, you're, you might normally want to kill, like everything from yeast infections to the more, more serious infections that people can get, you could actually, with a straight face, say this agent could do that because it's, it's actually quite, quite toxic to those. Okay. And we don't know how it works. Um, that's one of the, the things we're still, we're still working on. So that actually ends the, the story I wanted to tell you. Uh, the story about a beetle, uh, a couple of fungi, uh, a mutualist bacteria, and, and the molecule that it made. And, but I wanted to then spend a few minutes saying, uh, trying to answer a question that you would be too polite to ask. Okay. And that question is, why is he doing this? Right? <laughs> why, of all the things he could have talked about, right, to an interesting group of high school teachers, did he talk about this? <laughs> you know, is, is there any big important lesson here? Or is this just some weird thing that southern pine beetles uh, do? And, and the answer is that, I, that, and obviously if I ask the question, that, that I think there actually is a very important uh, general uh, lesson that one, uh, that one can learn, uh, learn from this. And, uh, and, and the lesson is the following. I told you about the case where it's, a, where it's the southern pine beetle. You might say, what about the western pine beetle, or the Asian pine beetle, or the European pine beetle? Turns out they're exactly the same. Right? They have a food fungus, they have an antagonistic fungus, and now we know they have a bacteria. Uh, and the bacteria actually all do completely different things. There are, in addition to all of these bark beetles, of which there are several hundred species of bark beetles, there are things called ambrosia beetles. Ambrosia beetles are just like these beetles, except they attack dead trees. Okay. They get in, 
Uh, they seed it with a fungus, which starts dissolving away the tree. They lay eggs, their larvae come, and the ambrosia uh, fungi have these big, tasty-looking spores, right, sort of filled with sugar water that the larvae eat. Right? And uh, that's the ambrosia. And, uh, and, and so you'd say, well, how, how many ambrosia beetles are there? And there are about 3,000 species of ambrosia beetles in the world. <laughs> And we, we've now looked at about a dozen, okay, so a very small fraction, but it's all the same, right? There's the beetle, there's the food fungus, there's the antagonistic fungus, and now we can see the mutualistic bacteria. All different bacteria, all making different, different things. Um, then there's my favorite, and those are uh, leaf, cutter, leaf cutter ants. And, I do a lot of work in Costa Rica, and I n never forget the first time I went to Costa Rica, and you go into a rainforest, and you see all these, everything is green. And I made the mistake of going with an ecologist, the least romantic kind of person in the world. And he said, <laughs> you, know, you know, I'm going, wow, look at all the green. And he said, what do you think eats all this? And I said, I have no idea. And he said, actually, it's leafcutter ants. And they're these little ants, and, and what the movie shows is they're scurrying, and each one is carrying this huge chunk of a leaf, and they're carrying it uh, down, this, uh, uh, down this hole into, uh, into uh, their nest. And leafcutter ants are the major herbivores in the tropics. Mm -hmm. They're about 200, well, they're about, uh, there, there are tens of species of leafcutter ants, but there are about 200 th things like leafcutter ants. And so these show uh, leafcutter ants cutting leaves um, and, and carrying, and they can carry many multiples of their own weight back, uh, back to their uh, back to their nest. They can strip a tree overnight. If you find their nests, they, um, they you can see these big holes going down, then it, it's just like a clear path, right? They've cleared everything along the path and going up a tree, taking the leaves, going back down. Now, um, and then, so you might think that actually these leafcutter ants eat leaves, um, but they don't. What they do is they chew the leaves up and they feed them to a fungus that they have, uh, than they have in their nest underground. So this shows a couple of different kinds of the, of the leaf cutter ants in their fungal gardens. And so uh, we dug up a nest uh, about a year ago in Costa Rica, and, and you had to dig down about 20 feet. There can be millions of ants in these. It, can be, it was a big, about as big as those four tables, right? And, 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 and there are then just these cavern after cavern after cavern, each one filled, uh, filled with a fungus. And then, for many years, people said, why doesn't something attack the fungus? And they said, well, it's because the ants are always taking care of it. You, there, are, there are all these ants working, beavering away, pulling things that look funny away. It turns out, there's a fungus that kills that fungus. <laughs> so you can find dead nests where, uh, where this antagonistic fungus has finally overwhelmed uh, the, uh, the whole fungal garden and wiped out the entire, the entire ant colony. So, it's sounding familiar. There's an insect, uh, there's uh, a food fungus, a mutualist fungus, there's an antagonistic fungus. And then that was where uh, the story was for a while. And then people had noticed, because this was known since the late 1800s, that there were these, there were these, these ants were funny. Um, they might have, you know, like white patches on them. There are some down in their fungal garden. Or they might look like they had been dipped in powdered sugar. And, uh, and, and you go to the literature and you say, what are, what are, what are these things? And that, oh, that's wax. The ants make wax, right? And those are the waxy deposits. So then you look more carefully at, at some of these specialized uh, things. And what you see is actually, uh, you can probably see this coming, uh, bacteria, streptomyces, right? And these are specialized, um, so the ant, what the ants have really evolved to do is grow bacteria, right? So these are specialized bacterial growth chambers, right? They have the, all of these, this sort of lattice work that the bacteria can stick to and grow on. And if you dissect away what you can find, so this shows, um, shows one of the kinds of ants. And at each of those spots, if you dig in and, and dissect, what you find is that there's a, there's a little cell coming out, and that cell is excreting something out, which is what the, what the bacteria is living on. And those, little, and those white things are, are, uh, are a bacterial colony that are growing on the surface of the ant. 
And there, there's this one in, in, in cut open, so you can see, you can see where all of these um, food cells are. This is a, a different way of doing it where, where you have sort of a more diffuse uh, kind of arrangement. Okay? But it's by now exactly what you expected, right? An insect, two fungi, and a, and a bacteria. And the bacteria do exactly the same, uh, the same things. Uh, you, you have the, the, the insect, in this case a fungus farming ant. You have the mutualistic fungus. You have these, uh, these, these bacteria. And then the bacteria make uh, molecules. And you don't have to look at that if you don't want to, but it's very different from what the other, uh, what the other one was doing. The other one was sort of a straight line. This is sort of circles within circles. Right? And so you would say, well, how many ants are there? There are about 200 species of, uh, of these ants. Not all are leaf cutters. Some of them go out and they find dead insects, and that's what they feed to their, their fungal gardens. Some collect insect feces, and that's what they feed to their fungal gardens. But it, but it is, uh, and it's only in the New World, right? So you don't, you don't find uh, these, so they're now called fungus farming ants, and they're only in, in, uh, in the New World tropics. They're, they come, I think, about as far north as, as Arizona, but they're all through Central and, and South America. And, uh, and actually, it's the, uh, it's the ants that we've, uh, we've, we've begun working on the hardest. And so, and, and so now I'll, I'll give you two answers to the question about why, why, why would you work on these things. And the first is that it's not a specialized phenomenon. It, it is literally everywhere, right? And, and it, it just hasn't been appreciated because no one knew what to look for and no one knew uh, how to go about uh, doing the looking. But, but these these, rela these mutualist relationships between insects and bacteria uh, are, are very widespread. In fact, the argument is probably the, those mutualisms are so successful that they've led to bursts of, of, of evolutionary creativity. That is, that's why there are 200 species of fungus farming ants. Right? This was such a great idea. Let's hook up with the bacteria, right? That it, that it succeeded and, and led to um, led to uh, proliferation. So, that, so that's one reason, right? It's, it's not just an odd thing about southern pine beetles. It's, it's really um, uh, a generally true statement about the world in which we live. And the, the second is that you could say, well, it's also a way to find things, right? And as you all know, uh, we're running out of, uh, of small molecules that will kill. Uh, uh, we, need, we need better antifungal agents. Um, fungi are becoming resistant to the ones we're using. Uh, actually, the one, everything we're using is terrible. The real problem that's happening is fungal infections are spreading. Uh, they're spreading because um, uh, there are a lot of people, there, there's a higher proportion of people with, if you will, with, uh, with rundown immune systems. Older people, uh, uh, HIV AIDS patients, uh, people uh, who would say for certain kinds of uh, cancer drugs or for certain kinds of, um, uh, uh, of uh, say, are immunosuppressed for, for organ transplant, are all highly susceptible to fungal infections, and we basically have no, no good treatments. You can make, actually, the same argument for bacteria, right? So this is, um, these are actually kind of elegant. The, the problem is we always call them yellow jackets, and we always just associate them with picnics and things that are buzzing around sugary drinks. But if you if you forget about that and look at them, they're kind of elegant, uh, elegant looking uh, creatures and sort of all, all the bees and wasps and especially these, these yellow jackets and mud daubers and things like that because they live in really terrible conditions. I mean, if you ask me, you know, where does a mud dauber live? In the mud, right? And, and so, so it has a house in, uh, you know, this fetid, stinking mud that's, that's loaded with fungi, loaded with bacteria, right? Moist and hot, right? And that's where it's going to lay its eggs, and they're going to develop into larvae, right? What's going to keep them from getting eaten alive, literally, by, uh, by all the bacteria and fungi that are there? And the answer is, actually, that they also have uh, mutualistic bacteria that they use to spread around and that kill, uh, ki kill the, the things that would kill, kill their larvae. So it's a, 
it's a similar, um, it's a similar kind of thing. Uh, the, the, uh, this is obvious, but they, all they have the mutualist bacteria. They're not depending on, on eating that or, or anything else, but, but they use a mutualist bacteria to control, uh, to control these pathogens. And that turns out then to be a good way, because a lot of these are bacteria, to find new antibiotics. So it, it's a way, a directed search, that can lead you to new antifungal agents and to new antibiotics. Mm -hmm. Because uh, no one has ever thought of looking at these, I mean, no one ever knew there were these bacteria, so never, no one ever thought of looking there before. The, the real reason why, actually, I'm studying this is, is still different. And, and it has to do with what I, what I told you earlier. And it, and it really is because is uh, I'd like, like to, uh, uh, to study how the, the evolution of how these small molecules evolved. And it's a very interesting system because, as I told you, all the genes that make the proteins that go into building up this, this molecule are together. And they're not only together, we now know enough about the chemistry that goes into this, so you can say, oh, that's the gene that makes the enzyme that makes that bond, right? Or that's the gene that makes the enzyme that makes that bond, right? So you know the contribution of each gene to what you're looking for. And so if you think of this as, the, as saying this is a genotype, and this is a phenotype, but this is a very interesting genotype because it's a multi-gene genotype. And that's the kind of, 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 of genotypes we don't understand very well. I mean, you know, every day you read in the paper that they found 17 new genes that are somehow associated with diabetes. But you don't know how they're associated with diabetes. <laughs> you don't know what one does, right? And what's, what's, in, what's at least useful about doing it this way is, is that's a molecule. That's a completely clear phenotype, right? You, you either have it or you don't. And you, and you know how each gene contributes to, uh, to that phenotype. And so we had set about trying to understand how these, how these pathways evolved. And, uh, and, and the answer turned out to be, not surprisingly, that, that they evolved in a funny way. That is, normally you like to think of a phylogeny. There was, there was let's say, one species, and then all of a sudden uh, it turned into two other species, and then, and then they went along. And, and we're all used to looking at trees like this. And so you know that this was the parent of these two and, and like that. But with bacteria, that's not actually how they evolve at all, right? Because there's, I mean, there's no sex in bacteria. So there's all this promiscuous DNA swapping. And so they, it's all done by horizontal gene transfer. And so you can find a gene here. And it didn't come from here, it came from, you know, you either have no idea where it came from or it came from, you know, maybe somewhere up there or something, right? So bacterial species, especially if you're looking at their small molecules, are profoundly uh, chimeric, right? It's, I mean, if, if, if they looked like animals, they'd look like this, right? <laughs> and, 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 you, and you'd say, you know, that what we're doing is saying, well, they've got, both got wings, so they must be the same. But, but they are you know, they're, they're just completely weird. And, and now as we look at more and more genomes, we realize that there, that, that there is no simple sort of phylogeny, if you will, for bacteria, right? That it, it didn't happen that way. They are, they're mixed up in a, in a, in a profound, profound way. And that brings me uh, to the ants. Okay. <laughs> the ants are great. The ants are monophyletic, right? It happened once. <laughs> it all started with one ant, and it started uh, 50 to 65 million years ago. Okay? So you can do the, 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 the phylogeny of ants, and, and ants, because they're not bacteria, they have, a real, they have a real phylogeny. And then you can say, well, what about the, the food fungus that they eat? That was there right at the beginning except for one lineage down here. So don't look down here anymore. But that was right there at the beginning. And it, and it goes along with all of the other phylogeny. So the way the ants evolved is exactly the way their, their food fungus evolved. You say, well, that makes sense. They were completely dependent on each other, so they were, they were co-evolving. And what about the antagonistic fungus? Oh, yeah, that's the same, right? That was there right at the beginning, 50 million years ago. And then you can see it's coming. What about the bacteria? They were there right at the beginning. Right? 
and, and so they've been tracking all of this along for the last 50 or 60 million years. So it's a fabulous story. It's fabulous in, in, in many ways. First of all, you know, we we're, we're think we're great because we've been farming for you know, 10 or 15,000 years. Right? Ants have been farming right, for 50 million years, at least. Secondly, you know, we think we're terrific because we use bacteria to make antibiotics and antifungal agents and, and, and things that we use. Ants have been using exactly the same family of bacteria for 50 or 60 million years, right? So, so two great things, right, are not, are not new. Even more humiliating, this is still working for ants after 50 or 60 million years. We've blown through essentially every antibiotic and every antifungal agent we had in about 60 years, right? So there's actually a story here uh, of how, of, of resistance and sensitivity. That is how, how do you deploy antibiotics, right? So you don't develop rapid resistance. And so that's the, but the story that, that we want to follow is this. Because of, of, of the way this whole system evolved, we think that it's much more likely that if you now look at these bacteria, that because they've lived, if you will, a sheltered life, literally, right, that they won't have engaged in such promiscuous DNA swapping. And so that they may really have a lineage like, um, uh, uh, like, uh, uh, like ants or like us. And then the other thing that's true, and, and I think is even more important, is it's very hard to say whether something is getting better or worse, that is the molecule getting better or worse, if you don't know what that molecule is supposed to do. And with almost all of these molecules, we have no idea what they're supposed to do. We know what they do for us. You say, oh, penicillin, erythromycin, you know, rapamycin, all the, all, we have all these molecules, and we know, oh, that's good for cancer, that's good for immunosuppression, that's good as an antibiotic. But that's not how they spent their evolutionary history. They spent their evolutionary history for something else, but we have no idea what it is. So you can't tell whether you know, something has gotten better or worse because you don't, don't know its function. But here, you know the function, right? Because you know that it was supposed to kill this fungus and not that fungus. And so that's what we're starting then is, is, a, um, uh, is, is trying to unravel all of that. And uh, so there are people in the group working on beetles, uh, there are people in the group working on, uh, on bees and wasps and mud daubers, and uh, the big effort is on, uh, uh, is on ants, as, as, as I told you. And um, so there are many chemical stories uh, uh, and many genetic stories still to be learned. All right, that is, that's what I just told you. So that was the detailed story about the southern pine beetle. This just says that it's widespread. And, and can lead to new antimicrobial agents. And this just says that it, it also has lessons about evolution of antibiotic resistance and sensitivity and, uh, and biosynthesis. So let me tell you mostly, this was all started by a great uh, Korean postdoc named Dong Chan. And uh, he's now been joined by a, a German postdoc named Frank Surup, an American graduate student named Rene. So, uh, Dong Chan is now ants, Frank is beetles, Renee is, is bees. Uh, Michael and Laura are analyzing the genomes because we're sequencing a lot of genomes. None of this would have been possible without a very close collaboration with, uh, with my friend and colleague Cameron Curry, who's an evolutionary biologist and made the original discovery on the leafcutter ants. And he's at, uh, Cameron is at the University of Wisconsin. And Jared is, a, is the graduate student who worked with Dong Chan first on the southern pine beetle. Uh, Mikhail is, uh, is a postdoc who's working uh, with Frank and Rene. And Kier Klepsig is probably the person who started it all. He's uh, uh, in the USDA down in Louisiana. And he actually is the first person who looked in the mycangium and said, those aren't fungi, right? which is the start of the story. OK, that's it. Thanks. Yes. Um, on all the molecules that you've seen that the bacteria are making, do they all have those double bonds? No, no. no. Okay. The, the, it, it's it's, it's like it, they no they uh, bond arrangement. right, but they they no they all look they look as, as weird as those uh, composite animal pictures I showed. They're, mm -hmm. but and, but they go all There's over the map. No continuity whatsoever as far as not yet. But, but that I think is only because. 
literally we know um, one from a beetle, one from an ant, and, uh, and one from a bee, a mud dauber. And, uh, and my guess is, as is, is, is we do more and more bees or, or, or whatever, we'll start seeing family relationships. Um, so, so I think they'll appear, we just haven't seen them yet. Collapse disease in bees, is that possibly due to some problems? <coughs> no? Maybe, but, um, uh, but I don't know. So the, what we're actually studying in, in bees is a disease called foul brood, uh, which is uh, caused by a bacteria. And, but, but bees carry an, uh, another bacteria, strep, that actually makes something that's very good against uh, uh, foul brood is called, uh, I think it's, it's a pseudobacillus or something. But, but, so we're working on that. I, I don't know the answer, but, but I don't think colony collapse is, 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 is this. Can you say more about kind of the lessons about how to deploy antibiotics in a way that doesn't promote resistance? Like so so I, 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 don't, I, I don't know what the lessons are, but I can tell you what I think they are, and, and I don't know that they're then going to be lessons that are very good uh, uh, f for, for us um, in, in terms of medical usage. The, the lesson I think is going to be you, you, you don't use the most powerful antibiotic that you have. Right? <laughs> that is, you use something that's a 90% effective. That's good enough to keep right, your species, your colony, whatever, going, uh, but, it, but it doesn't you know, kill everything off because the more you kill, right, the faster you develop resistance. It's a little like when they, uh, you know, when they have some of these genetically engineered crops and they don't want resistance to come up too quickly to the toxin, they plant around the outside of the field. Uh, 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 cr the same crop that's not genetically engineered, and that's to, to have a, a reservoir of insects, right, that, that, uh, that won't get resistant, right? So they're not going to get killed, uh, they're not going to get killed by that. So I, so I suspect um, that's the lesson, right? Not, 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 not to use, right, um, something that's so powerful, you 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 know, you literally, you know, wipe out, you know, ten to the, you know, if you have ten to the seventh bacteria, you wipe all, wipe out all but a couple, right? And then and then those can can expand rapidly. So I, I suspect that's the answer. I don't I don't know it, but I'd be, I'd be surprised if that weren't the answer. And then then you can see that it it's not so good because if you're, you know, if you go to your doctor. He so, said, you know, I could give you something that would really wipe that out, but I'm going to give you something that'll, you know, it's about 95% <laughs> effective because um, we don't want resistance to develop too rapidly. Yes? Uh, one of the slides that you showed early on showed these uh, larvae in the cambium tissue of the yeah. tree. Was there any significance to that particular part of the back as opposed to other back tissues? So, so the cambium is, uh, uh, is, 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 the, is the best. I mean, it's, it's, the, uh, it's where all the nutrients are flowing and, uh, and, and where all the water is. And so, um, and, and, and the tissue is then relatively soft, right? Whereas if you go, the further you go into the tree, you know, sort of the harder and drier and, and things it, it becomes uh, to deal with. So. <coughs> So I think that, so they literally live right underneath the bark. And the, the larvae actually don't do much. The larvae sort of go and make, you could, I don't know if you remember, they had these sort of big oval cavities. Um, and they basically just live in there with, with fungus all around the outside. And that cavity keeps getting bigger as they, as, as they go munching, munching around. Have the trees evolved at all to protect themselves from these beetles? Like do they, do, and do they make different so, so resins now? To um, yeah, so I mean, I think, you know, the this, this system has been quite stable for, you know, millions of years. And, um, and, and so the trees are also evolving. And we haven't, we haven't looked at that, but I'm, but, but I'm sure they are. I, it's, it, it, I think the reason why it looks like it's such a big problem, I mean, it is such a big problem now, I think has more to do uh, with climate change, right, and, and then finding a lot of trees, I mean like last summer in the south where there were these terrible droughts, 
right? There were a lot of stressed trees, and so, and so the southern pine beetle went nuts. And, 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 and so I think, I think the problem is worse, but, but it's not, if, if you will, it's not because the beetles all of a sudden d discovered something that, that gave them a, a, a leg up on the tree. It's that, the, um, it's, it's that there are just more trees under stress. The, 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 the genes being close together, yeah. is that because of it, it started by some sort of horizontal? Exactly, exactly. Could it right. also be because maybe uh, you need all of those enzymes, you can't just have one and not the other? Or? So, so that's also true, right? But, but the point is when, you, when, when they exchange DNA, they exchange relatively small chunks. And, and, uh, and it only does you some good if you're getting the whole thing. You could imagine, actually, not only do you get all the genes that make, for example, the, the, an antibiotic, you also get the genes that keep you from getting, you get the resistance genes, the things that keep you from getting killed by that antibiotic. And you could, you could see how dangerous it would be to inherit just half of that, the genes that would make it without the genes that conferred immunity. Yeah. So, so they're, they're both, both reasons why, why they're thought to be clustered. Yeah. Are there good examples in this area, in Massachusetts, in Hampton, Rhode Island, of where this is supposed to be happening? I think there's southern pine beetles around here. I mean, I, I think. What? My backyard. I, mean, I saw pictures there. Yeah. And the pines of those, uh, it looks just like you drill the hole. And, and I don't no. know if they're, they're pine beetles or I always thought maybe they were carpenter ants or something. No, I think, I think they're these uh, bark beetles. Yeah. Yeah, no, they're all over. You're welcome to come and take them. <laughs> 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 and there, and uh, we were going to set up, um, I, I left it in Ithaca, um, but we were going we to set up a leafcutter ant colony. I mean, they're, they're kind of cool, because then, you know, you can build these little plexig. So it's in the Science Museum in Ithaca, New York, if anyone wants to go there. But it's, because the queens are huge. All these, and they have the soldiers and all the worker ants. When you were showing the fingers, they're literally that big? Yeah. Are they literally that big? Yeah. How big? Wow. No, they can be that big. How big are they? <laughs> I mean, I mean they, they lay millions. Of, the, workers, the, the workers vary. They're, they're very tiny if they're working down in the, f in, in, in the fungal gardens. Then they get a little, they get the foragers are bigger, and they have soldiers that are not very effective, but they have these sort of, they're scary looking, and, 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 and they're bigger still. Uh, yes? The, the types of um, fungus that they're growing, I'm just thinking yeah. about like my class, and we do all these log dissections, and we're, we do find the trails from termites and mm -hmm. other things. Are those, is that fungus? Dangerous, or do we know? Like, can we just culture some of that in a classroom? Or yeah, no, I don't think it's that? at all dangerous to people. Yeah. I'm sort of um, wondering if there's been any policy discussions with you, <laughs> or what, what your feeling is on, uh, you know, say I'm from the USDA and I'm willing to give you lots of research money to find me a silver bullet to stop the ash borer beetle or right. various other organisms, because it screams for like, okay, let's. Let's spray antibiotics across the forest and kill the bacteria <laughs> and stop, stop. Especially, yeah. and also, could you speak to, I guess, invasive species from the old world? If this isn't something that works in the old world, do you expect that that could, that this could cross over? Yeah. So I, uh, so honestly, I don't know. I mean, and the, um, and, and so it's not uncommon. Uh, well, I mean, I, I mean, I've only known most of this stuff for a couple of months, but, but invariably, someone wants to know. Uh, you know, what am I doing to save pine trees that are getting wiped out? And, and the honest answer is nothing. That, I mean, actually, I'm, I'm interested in a very different aspect of, of, of the problem. It's pretty problematic to try and play God now. And, and I think the, the problem with the idea of, of, let's say, distributing an antibiotic that would, let's say, kill the bacteria, so the, you know, is, is really one of access and, uh, and resistance coming up almost immediately, it would, would be my guess. I imagine people see this, or will see this, and think, well, we got, we got something here where we either go after the fungus or we go after the bacteria, or we play around with this to deal with invasive species or something like that. Right. Yes? With leafcutter ants, um, the fungus, does it also, I'm just thinking about the fungus, does it then break down molecules enough so that other trees can then access 
about yeah, no, so, so, what the, what the funga, so what the fungus does, I mean, literally what happens is the ants bring all these leaves down. And then, then these, these little workers that are doing this um, sort of bite parts out of them and then spit it over into a waste pile and then take other parts and sort of chew it up. And then they take it and then put it into the fungal garden. So, <coughs> so the fungal hyphae will then start growing through that and digesting all the plant material. And then, uh, and then the ants eat the, eat, eat the fungi. So, so, so then is it the ants waste then that is the molecules that then the tree roots can access? I'm just wondering, you know, it's continuing it's the cycle about, you know. Eventually. I, um, the compost. No. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, everything is recycled so fast in the tropics that it's hard. It, it's, it's sometimes hard to study that. No, but it just seems to make sense that if it's so fast, it does make something's sense. breaking it down quickly enough, it might be the fungus. Might, and be. That's the next might be. Another step. I mean, what what probably is true, <coughs> going back, uh, going back to. Um, uh, to that phylogeny that I showed you, is that what happened historic <coughs> historically, there, there were these two fungi, let's say on the forest floor, that were, were decomposing leaf litter. Right? And then they developed this an antagonistic relationship. One of them picked up a bacteria to help itself out. And then an insect came along and scooped up all three. So, so that's the sort of just so story. That <coughs> about how the system could have evolved. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.